This is a 62 year old gentleman who presented to my office. He presented with pretty bad and debilitating right arm pain. He had some weakness also on, on exam. He had really bad neck pain and he presented for a surgical consultation. This is his physical exam. You see, I, I usually test their gait to make sure they're able to walk and balance and don't have any difficulty in gait because that's a sign of cervical myelopathy or a, a really dysfunctional spinal cord that for us as spine surgeons uh, really catches our attention. Uh, the cervical spine, we examine it, have them flex and extend their neck. We check, we check for tenderness, any painful rotation. We do some special tests just to make sure that um, there's nothing that is concerning from a cervical uh, standpoint. I always check the shoulders as well, just to make sure that there's no shoulder involvement. Some patients will come to the spinal surgeon with uh, cervical pain or cervical condition that is actually coming from their shoulder. So we, we always always check the shoulder. They can be, there can be some overlap between the shoulder and the spine that you don't wanna operate on a patient who you think has a cervical condition is actually coming from their shoulder. So that's very important. This patient had failed conservative treatment. They had tried physical therapy, home exercise program, several medications. He tried cervical steroid injections. On physical exam, he had weakness in his right brachioradialis, which is C6, ECRL, which is C6, and his right triceps, which is C7. His reflexes were hypoactive in C5 and C6. They were normal in C7. So this is his physical exam. Let's check out his MRI. So let's go through his cervical MRI. Whenever I am evaluating a patient, I need to make sure that their clinical, their history, as well as their physical exam correlates with the MRI. So if a patient presents with left arm pain, I need to actually make sure that the imaging study shows something at the left side of the spine that corresponds with their symptoms. Whenever I pull up an MRI, I always pull up the sagittal view. This is essentially looking at it from the side and also axial view. And I have these up together and that's how I evaluate the MRI. This is the front of the spine here. This is the back of the spine. This is the front, this is the back here. Your spinal cord is this dark structure right here, and it has spinal fluid, or the white fluid around it, which is normal. Your brain is up here, specifically your brain stem. This is your, your esophagus, and then the spinous process will be back here, and you'll see that. This is a cervical vertebrae, so two, three, four, five, six, seven. Between each of the cervical vertebrae, you have your disc or your cushion, it should be nice and symmetric at every level. What happens is as we age, this disc desiccates, it wears out, it dries out, and then it pushes out either on the nerve or the spinal cord, which you can see here. If I scroll through this sagittal uh, view here, you can see that this herniation at these levels here, it, it's putting a lot of pressure on the spinal cord. You can see it here. And if I go to the other side, at the level just below that, a huge disc herniation here. You can see the amount of space where the spinal cord has decreased here. So that's why a patient would get shooting pain down their arm. They may have weakness. They may have gait abnormalities if the patient has a condition called cervical myelopathy. But we're gonna start off at the top of the spine at C2, C3. You will see that this is a fairly normal space for the spinal canal. You see all the fluid around the spinal cord, which is here. If I go back up one slice, uh, the, the nerves have room and they have space to go through these little tunnels here. And his has some degenerative changes from the facets here, um, some arthritis, but that, that area for the nerve is a little bit smaller on this side, but I didn't feel like that area this level needed to be addressed. If we go down to C3, C4, which is here, you can see this line here corresponds to the level. And this is the uh, third vertebrae fourth. Um, not a lot of pressure on the spinal cord itself. The nerves are, uh, I would say, mildly tight. Uh, they have a little bit of pressure on them. But I didn't think his symptoms were coming from this. So when a patient comes in, we have to make sure that their symptoms correspond to what we see on the imaging studies. Even though we see certain features or stenosis or herniations on the MRI, 
That doesn't mean a patient's gonna have symptoms from it, and it doesn't mean that we have to address it. We need to find what level is actually causing the patient's symptoms and do what's called symptom-specific surgery. Address the levels of the spine that are causing these symptoms or causing the patient to have weakness. If we go down to the next level, which I thought was his symptomatic level, and I know this because of his history and what he's telling me and where the pain's radiating. So this is C3, C4. A lot of pressure on the spinal cord, especially on the right side here. The left side is uh, tight also, but mostly on the, the right. So this is the right, this is the left because of the way the patients land in the MRI scanner. If we go down to C5, C6, you see there's a lot of pressure on the spinal cord. His spinal cord is actually crushed here. There's a lot of pressure on both of the nerves on both sides. They're severely tight. And then the bottom level where we saw that huge disc herniation, you can see it here on the right side huge disc herniation. The spinal cord has been crushed. Um, I'll show you guys a normal level again. It's supposed to look like this, but now it looks like this and this. So the goal is to take the pressure off of the spinal cord, essentially going through this little plane right here. Uh, this is the carotid artery. These are the longest coli muscles right here. So go through this little plane and then take all the, the disease discs to take the pressure off of this area and then put spacers in here to essentially fuse this area and directly decompress the spine. So this is an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, which means we go anterior disc cervical cervical spine, which is this discectomy, removing the disc and fusion placing spacers and K, a um, plate and some screws to fuse this part of the spine. All right, ACDFs, one of my favorite surgeries to do. It is actually one of the most commonly performed surgeries performed by spine surgeons. It has a really good outcomes. Patients do great from it. So we're focusing on the cervical spine, which is at the top portion of your neck. Usually these patients will present, they're usually supine, which means they're laying on their back. We can usually make an incision on the left side of the neck or on the right side of the neck. It depends on surgeon's preference, but for me, I usually go on the left side of the neck. We use special instruments and retractors to hold open the muscles. We don't cut any muscles during this procedure. We essentially, we just move them out of the way to actually get down to the spine. The whole premise is to do the discectomy, which is to remove that disease disc and then place a either a metal or a plastic cage or spacer in between those bones to fuse it together and then place a plate and some screws. So the first step of this procedure is to perform the discectomy. I'm using a knife here or blade. You can see the retractors are holding back the muscles. You can see some of the longest coli kind of sticking out there. This is not what I typically like to see, but uh, I think in this case, the longest coli was mostly just um, kind of sticking out from the retractor. Usually you don't want to see that. I'm doing the discectomy, which means removing the disease disc from between those bones. I have two pin retractors, they're called Caspar pins. This is a kerosene to help open up that space even more to take the pressure off of that level. This portion here, I'm doing the end plate preparation, which is the vertebral bodies. I'm using a drill or a burr, some people call it, to essentially remove any bone spurs to just make a nice kind of rectangle uh, structure or a space so that I can put that spacer in there to help that area fuse together. You don't want to take off too much of the end plate because of the risk of subsidence or the cage actually moving. You just want to take off that area so that it can actually fuse enough of it so it can fuse. This is some saline that we're using to just rinse out. You're looking under the microscope. And then this is, I already have placed my one of my spacers in. This is a special retractor that I use to open up the disc space to make more space. You can see it's opening up. The uh, cage, that we're putting in, it's a uh, peak or plastic cage that, that goes into the disc space to help it fuse together. And this is a graft, a bone graft that is around it to help it fuse. All right, we're gonna put that second spacer or that cage in there. This is a trial, and this is the actual cage or spacer. It's peak or plastic. You can see their markers, those lines, that tells me how far I should go. 
And then we're gonna put the third spacer in. You see the lines of the third spacer. You don't wanna go too far, the spinal cord is nearby. Putting the plates for temporary fixation to see how it looks. And then this is the final product, anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. Thank you guys for watching, we'll see you next time.